Hello and uh, welcome everyone to, to tonight's live event. Uh, it's going to be a very educational evening as we're gonna be covering investing like a stock superstar, uh, a fundamental and technical approach to seeking growth stocks. My name is Derek Hageman. I'm a financial analyst at AAII and I'm also the editor of AAII's Dividend Investing Service and I'll be serving as tonight's moderator. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Wayne Thorpe. I think this is the, well, this is the fourth time actually that Wayne and I have teamed up over the past few months uh, on this series of webinars. Uh, it's been quite a journey. We've talked about uh, investing like a stock superstar, uh, value investing with a twist, uh, the third segment was called A Contrarian Approach to Seeking Fundamental Growth. Uh, and as I've mentioned on these previous webinars, Wayne certainly wears a lot of different hats at uh, AAII. Among numerous distinctions, uh, Wayne is the lead analyst and editor of the Stock Superstars Report. He is also the senior financial analyst and a vice president at AAII. Welcome, Wayne, and thank you for joining us. Oh, thank you, you Derek. It's a pleasure to be here. Ah, hanging yeah. in there. You know, it's. Uh, you know, I realized earlier today that uh, today marks the the six month anniversary of the last time that I was in the office or the city of Chicago. Uh, so it was. It's interesting. I've spent more time in the state of Michigan over the last six months than I have in the city of Chicago. So, very <laughs> very interesting times indeed. Definitely, definitely. So, well, definitely looking forward to tonight's presentation, but uh, before we get started tonight, uh, I know Ryan mentioned it, but I'll, I'll say it again. I just wanna remind everyone uh, in the audience tonight that we are recording the presentation. Uh, so rest assured, you can see this again. It will be available on our YouTube channel. Uh, I will be here listening for questions. So please go ahead and type your question into the questions panel and uh, Wayne will be answering these questions at the, the end of the presentation. So I'm gonna turn off my camera here in a second and I'll be looking forward to getting your questions for Wayne. And Wayne, we look forward to your presentation tonight on a fundamental and technical approach to seeking uh, growth stocks. So with that, please take it away, Wayne. Thank you very much, Derek. And uh, once again, uh, thank you for serving as, uh, as my moderator. And I also wanna give a shout out to uh, our man behind the scenes, Ryan, who uh, makes sure that everything runs smoothly and uh, gets these webinars uh, edited and posted uh, for, for online viewing as well. So thank you very much for Ryan as well. Uh, good evening, everyone. And uh, welcome to the latest installment of AAII's Webinar Wednesday. Uh, if you don't know, my name is Wayne Thorpe. I'm the Senior Financial Analyst at AAII uh, and Lead Analyst for the Stock Superstars Report. Uh, I wanna thank all of you for joining, this, joining me this evening for what is the fourth installment of my Investing Like a Stock Superstars series. Uh, tonight, I will be talking to you about a strategy for identifying stocks with the characteristics of the biggest stock market winners of the last seven decades using both technical and fundamental analysis techniques. As has been mentioned multiple times this evening, uh, as I go along, feel free to submit any questions you have uh, through the GoToWebinar control panel. Uh, and at the conclusion of my presentation this evening, uh, Derek will go through those questions uh, and we'll try to answer as many as we can. So with that, off we go. So for over 20 years now, uh, I've been involved with quantitative stock screening here at the association. And over that time, I can almost guarantee that I've studied well over 100 different stock screening and selection strategies, uh, covering a wide variety of styles. And through that analysis, I've come across several strategies based on the investment methodologies of both professional money managers as well as academics that have outperformed the overall market on a long-term basis. And we at AII have come to call these uh, different individuals stock superstars. And amongst them uh, are some that I've spoken about over the last couple of months, uh, Jim O'Shaughnessy, uh, David Dremen, and John Neff. Um, and me personally, by studying these underlying criteria and these different winning approaches, I've become a better investor uh, and better at analyzing, selecting, and managing stocks. And that's the primary reason why AAII 
uh, as an educational association, presents these different approaches to both our members to help them to assist them in becoming better managers of their own stock portfolios. Members of AII have access to nearly 60 different screening strategies, and 42 of those are based on uh, the approaches of quote unquote guru investors. Uh, at a more granular level, we also identify the significant factors that make up the underlying criteria for each of these strategies. So for example, as you can see uh, here on slide four, uh, William O'Neill's CanSlim screen uh, has both elements of growth and momentum. Whereas for example, the O'Shaughnessy Tiny Titan screen has elements of value, momentum, and size, specifically focusing on small cap stocks. So you can both identify st screening strategies based on gurus, but then also if you tend to be more of a value investor, more of a momentum investor, uh, like to blend value and momentum like that, you have an easy way to identify some of the key underlying factors uh, for all of these different strategies. Now the passing companies lists of all of these different stock screens are updated on a monthly basis, usually on the first trading day of the month for all regular AAII members. We also provide back-tested performance, of performance data of the hypothetical portfolios of the stocks that are passing each of these strategies, along with a detailed explanation of each approach. Now, subscribers to AAII's A Plus Investor Service and Stock Investor Pro get daily updates to these passing companies lists. Now, if you're interested in learning more about these, you can identify and review these different screening strategies at the stock screens area of AAII.com. But tonight, uh, I'm gonna focus in on our, our featured stock superstar, uh, and that is, uh, who is uh, William O'Neill? For those of you that aren't familiar with William O'Neill, he started his career in 1958 as a stockbroker, and in his early years, he developed an investment strategy, which later became known as the Canslim approach, that made early use of computers, becoming one of the top performing brokers at his firm. At age 30, O'Neill bought a seat on the New York Stock Exchange uh, and became at the time the youngest individual ever to own a seat on the NYSE. In 1963, O'Neill founded William O'Neill and Company, which developed the very first computerized securities database. Almost 20 years later in 1984, O'Neill made research from his database available in print form with the launch of Investor, Investors Daily, which is today known as Investors Business Daily. CanSlim is an acronym that O'Neill created to help investors remember the seven factors he identified of the biggest stock market winners prior to their big price advancements. O'Neill discusses the CanSlim approach in his best-selling book, get it right here, How to Make Money in Stocks which is now in its fourth edition. However, the version of Canslim I'll be talking about this evening comes from the second edition, which uh, has the red cover here, as you can see. In preparation for tonight, I also reviewed Matthew Galgani's book, How to Make Money in Stocks, Getting Started. And it's kind of funny, uh, this book has actually been sitting on my bookshelf for almost 10 years now, uh, and I'd never cracked it, uh, never thought it was much value, uh, and I'm kicking myself for not reviewing it before. Uh, I was very pleased to find that it's an excellent supplement to O'Neill's book. So if you are very interested uh, in the CanSlim strategy beyond what I talk about this evening, I definitely recommend reading any one of O'Neill's books, How to Get How to Make Money in Stocks. But I'd also pick up uh, Galgani's book. I think this is a it's a very good overview, a very good primer for for the overall uh, CanSlim approach. But reviewing uh, Galgani's book. Um, he emphasizes what he calls three big rocks that every CanSlim follower should remember. First off, only buy stocks when the market is in an uptrend. Two, focus on companies with big earnings growth and a new innovative product or service. And three, buy stocks being heavily bought by institutional investors. But before I jump into the elements of CanSlim, I want to touch on the foundation of the overall CanSlim approach. Since the 1950s, O'Neill has been studying the biggest stock market winners dating back now over 100 years. 
and identifies the common elements each possess prior to their big price run-ups. Likewise, he examines the patterns these same stocks exhibit prior to their extraordinary gains coming to an end, which he has used to develop his sell rules. But now it's time to start covering the seven traits of these stock market winners, commonly known as CanSlim, and how they tie in with Galgani's three big rocks. For O'Neill and the CanSlim strategy, everything basically begins and ends with the trend of the overall market, even though it's the last element of CanSlim, which the M element stands for market direction. For those of you who've read my articles over the years or have heard me speak, you know that I'm not a firm believer in using market timing to make wholesale strategic portfolio moves. Namely, this is because I personally think it's incredibly difficult to do so consistently, as well as mark the fact that market timing isn't a one size fits all endeavor, again, in my opinion. However, I am a believer in using technical analysis uh, and actually, uh, I wore my black shirt tonight because in some ways I'm considered the black sheep of the association because I do believe uh, that technical analysis uh, can be useful. Uh, but I do believe in use technical analysis, which I feel does help investors make tactical timing decisions, which I feel is what O'Neill is doing uh, when he's using technical analysis and chart analysis to invest in fast moving high growth stocks. Galgani's big rock number one states that we should only buy stocks in a market uptrend and that we should take defensive action when the market begins a downturn. Well, to gauge the direction of the overall market, O'Neill follows intraday, daily, and weekly price charts of major market indexes, such as the NASDAQ composite and the S&P 500. To him, the trend is truly his friend. IBD research shows that three of four stocks go up during a market uptrend, while 75% of stocks fall when the market is in decline. So based on that data, it definitely seems it make a worthwhile endeavor to pay attention to what the overall market is doing. For O'Neill, he prefers buying when the market is in a confirmed uptrend. He becomes more cautious when the uptrend comes under pressure, and he suggests tightening your defensive stops when that starts to take place. He ultimately starts pairing his positions and no longer adds new stocks when the uptrend reverses. So here, for example, we can see a weekly price chart of the NASDAQ composite, which is created, uh, I created using the uh, stockcharts.com website. And I updated uh, this uh, after, is this? Yes. Uh, actually, this was mid-afternoon. Uh, it was through, I think the market uh, sold off a little bit at the end. So this was uh, intraday uh, earlier today. Here we can see that after the sell-off, a very sharp sell-off uh, that took place in March, which brought to the end the longest running bull market uh, in the US market history, the NASDAQ began a 22-week upward trek. However, after hitting a new all-time high the first week of this September, uh, the overall market indexes, and in this case, the NASDAQ, has run into a, a bit of a wall, uh, and we can see that momentum has barting, been starting to slow. Uh, at one point, actually, it even closed below uh, its 10-week moving average, uh, but this week, it has moved slightly above. Uh, it is still flirting with it, but uh, at least it's above the 50-day moving average, which I'll talk about a little bit later, but which is a major uh, technical milestone uh, for O'Neill. So when it comes to the market direction, uh, we are still, I would classify it in being uh, in a confirmed uptrend, uh, but it is definitely coming under some pressure. Uh, so I'd like to see uh, ultimately the market to maybe just start to rebound more strongly uh, and even hit a new all-time high. I think that would be a good confirmation that the current trend uh, is still intact. But in the off chance uh, that things start to, to change, uh, I wanna to touch on some areas and some elements you can look at to help identify changes in the market trend. You know, very broadly speaking, the market is generally in two phases. It's in an established trend, whether that's an uptrend or a downtrend, or we're seeing that's transitional, where it's moving from one trend to another. 
it's pretty easy to see whether the market is in the confirmed up or downtrend. Um, however, in identifying when a market shift is taking place, perhaps such as what's going on right now, is a little trickier. But with practice, just like most other things in life, uh, with practice, it's able to identify these changes in market trend much more easily. What we do, <clears throat> we do this by following what O'Neill calls follow through days and distribution days. To identify a new uptrend in the market, it starts with a new low. That's There always has to be a bottom before you can start uh, rebounding. Uh, and in this case, you're looking for a low in one or more of the major market indexes, such as the S&P 500 or the NASDAQ composite. Following a new low, the market may turn higher on above average volume, which we would call the first day of an attempted rally. After we have that first day of an attempted rally, we start looking for what is called a follow through day, which serves as confirmation at, that a new uptrend has, has started. These follow through days typically follow through days typically occur on days four to seven of an attempted rally. We're looking for a strong daily gain in the index, usually more than one and a half percent, on much heavier than usual volume. This highlights the need for daily monitoring of the market and your can slim stocks. Uh, some of the materials I've written is uh, O'Neill's actually even pointed to intraday shifts uh, in the trend. Uh, so it can, these trends can be readily, easily identifiable even on an intraday basis, but definitely on a daily basis, as we start nearing what we think might be a transitional period in the marketplace, it's definitely important to really start paying very close attention to the overall market. And again, if you're on the sidelines and you're waiting to get into a market, a new uptrend in the market can be as close as four trading days away, according to O'Neill. So again, uh, changes in the market, especially going from a downtrend to an uptrend, uh, which when most people are looking to buy, can happen relatively quickly. So here, you know, throwing back an, an oldie but a goodie example is we're looking at uh, the bottom of the stock market uh, in March of 2009. Uh, 2007, 2008, an abysmal period in the stock market. Uh, I, I've, I try to forget it. Uh, luckily, my portfolio has rebounded from it, uh, but it was definitely a, a pretty rough period for, for most investors. Um, but we see that the market uh, was coming down. It had been in a prolonged downtrend as we entered in uh, the start of 2009. Um, on March 9th is the uh, the uh, infamous, well, I guess uh, actually people looking at it in a favorable light is actually the bottom uh, of the 2007-2008 uh, market decline. Uh, and then on uh, March 10th, we have day one of an attempted rally in the NASDAQ. Uh, the previous day, the NASDAQ had hit a new 52-week uh, low. But on March 10th, the index went up almost 2% uh, on an 18% 8, increase in volume over the previous day. So this matches all of the hallmarks that we're looking for uh, for day one of an attempted rally. So then uh, seven days later on March 18th, 2009, we have that follow through day that we were looking for. Uh, this took place on day seven. Uh, and typically O'Neill says that these follow through days can take place on days four through seven. So it took place on day seven. Um, and on that day, the market was up, the index was up uh, 2% on a 33% increase in volume over the previous day. So you have a relatively strong uh, increase in the overall market on a significant increase in volume. Uh, and then we know as the rest they say is history, uh, the market went on a, a very strong tear uh, the rest of 2010 uh, and put the market doldrums of the previous two years uh, well behind it. Perhaps of greater importance to most of us right now is trying to identify signs of a weakening market. Uh, just like all downtrends eventually will reverse, uh, so too all uptrends eventually will come into an end. Um, and in way in which we try to identify whether or not an uptrend is starting is coming to an end is by counting what are called distribution days. A distribution day is the is a down day in the market on rising day over day volume. Uh, an increase in the number of distribution days over the last uh, four or five weeks 
sounds a warning that large investors, namely institutions, are ramping up their selling. Four or five distribution days over a, th over a three to five week period, according to O'Neill, is proof that the uptrend is coming to an end. So here is another classic example. Uh, this is the uh, the infamous market uh, stock market bubble of the dot com era, uh, and this is uh, in that case the the market uh, reached its apex uh, in roughly March of 2000. Uh, and this chart here is a is a daily chart of the Nasdaq Composite uh, leading up to uh, March of 2000. Fortunately, it seems that my date access was cut off i apologize for that but this is uh march uh basically it's all of 2000 so from january 1st to the end of december of 2000 but we can see here on the left side of the chart the uh the nasdaq was was going through a, a pretty good uh market increase uh but then we can see here uh in late february early march uh, after hitting a peak i uh, had a couple pretty strong down days um and uh these are these distribution days that we're talking about. Uh, and actually between February 28th and March 29th of 2000, the NASDAQ saw five distribution days. Uh, and the last three days of March saw the index fall more than two and a half percent every day with an average day over day increase in volume of nearly 12%. So even, you know, the market ended up going down significantly after that. But within you know less than two weeks of hitting a market uh, a new all-time high, we were able to see through market uh, through chart analysis uh, pretty strong indications that the overall trend had started to reverse. At which point, uh, people who were fortunate enough to recognize this uh, and believed um, in these distribution days as a as an indicator of a over rolling over market uh, could have started to take defensive measures uh, and started paring down their holdings. So getting to rock, big rock number two uh, is O'Neill's research of stock market winners shows that almost all of them were are uh, all of the stocks that went through significant price gains over the last 100 years were ex exhibiting strong earnings growth on both a quarterly and annual basis, supported by a new product or service or some new industry trend or new key management or team member before these price increases took place. And that's the key is all of the elements of CanSlim are the characteristics that the biggest stock market winners of the last 100 years were exhibiting prior to their big price run-ups. So ultimately with the CanSlim approach is we're trying to identify these stocks, stocks today that are exhibiting the characteristics that historically have preceded significant price increases. So when we're tying in the CanSlim approach with these big rocks, uh, the three, first three elements of the CanSlim approach, C, A, and N, uh, are tied into big rock number two. C in CanSlim stands for current, current quarterly EPS. Uh, and here, O'Neill is referring to same quarter increases. So we would compare the earnings in the first quarter of 2019 to those of the first quarter of 2020, not the first quarter to the second quarter of 2020. By looking at the same quarter over different years, we're eliminating any seasonality in revenues and earnings that may exist with the company. O'Neill also uses earnings from continuing operations, which ignores special or one-time gains or charges, and is ultimately a better indicator of future earnings. The stock market winners in O'Neill's analysis usually had quarterly earnings growth of at least 20% for the last quarter, and often over the last two or three quarters. These same stocks were seeing acceleration in their quarterly earnings growth as well. So for example, year-over-year -year earnings growth for the last quarter might have been 30% compared to 20% year-over-year earnings growth over the prior quarter. So not only are they exhibiting very strong earnings growth, but that growth is building uh, as we move from period to period. Pardon me. So the A in CanSlim stands for annual EPS. So beyond generating strong quarterly growth, past stock market winners were also seeing consistent growth in annual earnings before their large price run-ups. 
This includes four or five years of year-over-year -year earnings growth and annualized growth over that period of at least 25%. O'Neill says he is willing to accept one year of earnings declines, but that rebound needs to be especially strong and bring it back to the level of what it was before the earnings drop. He also suggests looking at earnings, the, the earnings estimate for the next year, although he does warn this is only an opinion of analysts. He also places a strong premium on stable earnings growth, which is why we want to follow through and do an analysis of year-over-year -year earnings. The N element of CanSlim stands for new company, product or service, industry trend, or management. O'Neill's analysis of stock market winners also revealed that it takes something new to produce these extraordinary stock gains. In studying the greatest stock market winners from 1953 to 1993, the period covered in the second edition of his book, How to Make Money in Stocks, O'Neill found that almost 95% of these companies either had a new product or service, new management, or there was an important change for the better in the underlying conditions for their particular industry. Now, as a proxy for what is new, uh, we're also looking for new or near new uh, high prices. So O'Neill suggests looking for stocks that are actually within 10% of their 52-week high. Galgani's big rock number three focus on, focuses on demand for stocks by large investors, uh, which ultimately control the market and the fate of individual stocks. Uh, these big investors, these big institutional investors, include mutual funds, hedge funds, pension funds, and insurance companies. As a student of technical analysis or chart analysis, <coughs> O'Neill is a believer in the laws of supply and demand when it comes to shares of stocks. Thus, the S element of CanSlim is supply and demand. For O'Neill, the best case scenario is finding a high earnings growth company that has institutional investors battling it out for a limited number of outstanding shares. This limited supply and increased demand helps power the share price even higher. When looking at the price behavior of a stock, however, O'Neill doesn't do so in isolation. Instead, he is looking for confirmation in the form of above average trading volume. One of the key tenets of technical analysis is that price movement supported by an increase in volume is more apt to follow through than any price movements that are made on weak volume. The L element of CanSlim is leader or laggard. O'Neill prefers to buy best in class stocks in each industry, assuming that the industry itself is strong. He warns against investing in lower price laggards or even trying to invest in a leader in a subpar industry. <coughs> Pardon me. To help identify the leaders in the market, O'Neill uses relative price strength, which indicates how well a stock is performing relative to the overall market, such as the S&P 500, or its respective sector or industry. Specifically, O'Neill suggests limiting yourself to stocks outperforming at least 80% of the market, or those in the top 20%, but while they're still in a base chart pattern, which I will discuss a little bit later. Alternatively, you should avoid stocks where the relative strength has been steady in steady decline over the last several months, or has seen a sharp drop in just the last few months. The eye of CanSlim refers to institutional sponsorship. And for O'Neill, he feels that it doesn't pay to be the first of the party. Instead, he prefers to follow others into the fray, specifically institutional investors, and ideally, a few top-rated mutual funds. O'Neill also tracks the number of mutual funds owning a stock, hoping to see this number increase over time. So as we see here, there's a recurring theme here uh, regarding looking at what sort of what the big money is doing. And ultimately, we're trying to find stocks that 
not only have very strong earnings growth, but also have interest amongst institutional and top rated funds, because it's the money that's flowing in to these individual stocks that are going to ultimately boost the stock price. So we've reviewed the key elements when it comes, at least the key fundamental elements when it comes to identifying stocks that meet the can slim approach, that things that you'd be looking for on the buy side of things. But ultimately, you know, not ultimately, but just as important is knowing when to sell. O'Neill uses fundamental factors to <clears throat> uses fundamental factors to it that uh, he looks for in the stock stocks that he buys. But by and large, he uses charts and technical analysis to decide when it's time to sell. The closest he comes to mentioning a fundamental sell rule in the second edition of How to Make Money in Stocks is stating that consecutive quarters of slowing earnings growth should be sign, seen as a warning sign. However, he strongly believes that the stock price will more quickly reflect deteriorating fundamentals than a company's quarterly earnings report. Now there's two types of selling that is referred to in uh, Galgani's book, defensive and offensive selling. And starting with offensive selling, here you're trying to lock in your profits. And what, for O'Neill, he's willing to dink and dunk his way to market beating performance. He suggests taking profits at or only a 25, 20 to 25% gain, although not necessarily selling your entire position. He also doesn't have a problem rebuying the same stock over and over as long as it has the same underlying criteria that he's looking for in a can slim stock, and that it's also at proper buy points. He doesn't buy a stock just because it's cheaper. He always is using charts and technical analysis to tell him when to buy. However, rapidly growing stocks do tend to have longer runways. So he's willing to hold them for at least two months if they hit a 20% gain over that period, assuming again that the price is breaking out of a base pattern. In addition, though, it should not overrule any defensive stops that you might have set up <clears throat> to prevent that are, you've set up to prevent you from losing any or all of your gains, or even worse, allowing a gain to turn into a loss. Now, the other element of selling is defensive selling, in which we're trying to cut our losses short and protect our gains. As a close follower of the market, O'Neill takes starts taking defensive action as soon as the current market uptrend comes under pressure, which it would be as right now, or ultimately enters into a correction. He also has a hard and fast rule of selling if you have a 7% or 8% loss in a position from where you bought it. His reasoning is that a 20%, 30%, or 40% loss is always a 7% or 8% loss first. And he's willing to take very small losses to protect against even larger ones. O'Neill also has some additional rules that can be used perhaps that you can use to perhaps get you out of a position before it turns into a 7% or 8% loss. This includes selling following the single biggest daily loss following a proper buy point on the heaviest volume in several weeks or months. O'Neill also uses the 50 day or 10 week moving averages to identify levels of support. And when violation of the support takes place, this is definitely a, a strong negative uh, in his regard. So why do we use charts? Unique to the can slim strategy, especially compared to the other strategies I've highlighted over the last, fast month, last few months, is that charts are used to identify entry and exit points. Uh, actually, this is a, I, I'm, I'm very fascinated for different reasons about all the different approaches that I've talked about uh, over the last four years, over the last few months. But the CanSlim approach really, I think, is, is the one that excites me the most. Even though I tend to be a, a more value-oriented uh, investor, I like you know, the, the daily analysis of, of the markets and the individual stocks. So, you know, if you're someone who is more of a set it and forget it type of investor, then perhaps the can approach 
isn't for you. But if you're a sort of a student of the market and don't mind, you know, spending you know some time on a daily basis or even looking at the market on an intraday basis, the can slim strategy might be uh, something that might be interesting to you. <clears throat> so, you know, when you're looking at charts, it's very important to remember that just because a stock meets the fundamental criteria of can slim doesn't automatically mean that it should be bought. And this is perhaps uh, uh, something that I, I've given the presentations about the can slim approach numerous times over the years, but perhaps this is an element that I've not necessarily stressed nearly enough. Um, beyond buying only when the market is in an uptrend, we should also only be buying can slim uh, stocks that are breaking out of base patterns on higher volume. Uh, and these are these proper buy points that I've referred to uh, on multiple occasions. As a manager of the portfolio of stocks following the can slim screen, I personally have been burned more than a few times by breaking this important rule of can slim investing by buying at the proper buy point. Uh, I have unfortunately on a couple occasions fallen into, it meets the criteria, let's buy it, but not waiting for it to actually hit these proper buy points. So this is something that I think is very important to remember. Uh, so, you know, another reason why you look at charts is because they provide us with a clear idea of what the big market is doing, what the big money is doing. Since institutions command anywhere from 80% to 90% of the market's trading volume. And looking at a chart, we can instantly see you know, our institutions buying or selling. That'll dictate whether or not a stock is ultimately going up or down. Our institutions supporting the stock price at specific price levels. Uh, many times you'll see where a stock might go through a sell off, but it'll reach to a certain point and the buying volume kicks back in and it bounces off that level of support. Or uh, our, our institutions basically rushing for the exits and you're seeing that the downside momentum is starting to build, and both, build in both the market and individual stock. A proper discussion of charting analysis would easily take several hours, but with the time that I have, and I am uh, starting to see I'm going a little long, is that I wanna highlight a few key concepts when it comes to chart analysis. Reviewing a chart, Galgani suggests that we focus on three key elements. What's the trend? Be sure you're looking at both price and volume and try to figure out if is the market or the stock finding support or hitting resistance. Having a firm grasp on these three things can help you identify whether the trend is ongoing or beginning to shift, whether any potential shift in trend is being supported by volume and whether a Galgani key support or resistance level has been breached. Also on, above average, also on above average volume, they could point to a shift in trend or an advance the current trend. So these three elements, when you're looking at a chart, try to answer these three questions and pay attention to these different elements. And this will help you get an idea of what's going on in the market in an individual stock and help you decide whether or not uh, it might be you're reaching a, a proper buy point or might be time to start paring down or uh, on the positions you already have for your can slim stocks. The last bit of chart analysis I wanna to touch on is one of the most powerful patterns I've come across in my 20 plus years of looking at charts. This pattern is also one of O'Neill's favorites and that's the cup with handle pattern, the, the cup with handle pattern. So here we can see uh, an example of uh, for stock XPEL. Uh, and this was through the close on September 14th. Uh, please forgive my very crude drawing here, but this blue line here shows you uh, the rough cup with handle pattern for Expel. A cup with handle pattern normally forms after there's been a prior uptrend of 30% or more. Uh, in the case of Expel, uh, between April of 2018 and pretty much the beginning of this year, the price went from basically a penny to over $15. So we definitely had more than a 30% increase over that period of time. As, as it reaches this high and starts to retreat and ultimately starts forming what is called the cup uh, elements of the chart pattern, you wanna see that you're looking for a 15 to 30% uh, retracement uh, in, the, in the actual price. Uh, in this case, actually, we went a little bit above, more than that. We almost hit a 50% retracement. Um, but uh, so you see that the, during this retracement period, in this case, up to 50%, it then ultimately starts bottoming out 
and comes back to a level that's very almost equal equal level to where we were at the left side of the chart. So here now we've created the complete cup. Now the last element of that is the actual handle, which normally can last, uh, you know, a period of a few weeks or more. Not more, uh, probably several weeks, but not. You don't want to get too long. Sometimes you'll start seeing the handle get very elongated, uh, and that is, tends to be a very weak cup with handle pattern. <coughs> But you're looking for no more than about a 12% retracement of the heights of the both the right and the left side of the cup when you're forming the handle of the cup with handle period. So now we've got the cup, we've got the handle. Now we're waiting for that confirmation, that breakout. And what we've done here is I've drawn uh, a resistance line basically that's roughly equal to the two, the right and the, the left side of the cup. Now we wait to see if there's actual breakout above that on increased volume. And that's exactly what happened uh, in July for XPEL. Uh, we had a very strong up day, the long green uh, up, air, up line for the day on a significantly spike uh, in volume. Actually, uh, it's the second highest trading volume day uh, over the last almost three years. So here we have a very strong uh, confirmation of volume uh, for XPEL. And this is a confirmation that an actual cup with handle pattern has developed. But these are patterns. This is the pattern that O'Neill is looking for the most. And I get always, you know, as a as a as a chart lover, I get very excited when I start seeing uh, what looks like a, a cup starting to form. Uh, and I'll you know, I'll start looking to see, okay, we got we have a can uh, a handle that's starting to form here, uh, and then looking for that breakout. But this is definitely one of the most powerful chart patterns you're ever going to run across. Uh, when looking at charts. So I have now gone through basically the elements that involve the Can Slim strategy based on the second edition of O'Neill's How to Make Money in Stocks. Uh, I've talked a little bit about uh, how you can try to identify whether a trend is reversing or whether it's continuing, uh, as well as a very powerful chart pattern to look for uh, and that's that base pattern that I, one of those base patterns that I kept referring to. Um, if you see a, a stock that is exhibiting all the criteria of can slim and it's starting to form that cup with handle pattern, uh, you know, for me, it's uh, the excitement becomes, you know, palpable. And uh, it's very, it's, I always want to see whether that's what's going to happen with that. Uh, so if you're able to find all of those that come together, which is a rarity, but if they do come together, it's definitely, a, it's history has shown. Uh, can be a very powerful price pattern. But now having gone through all of this, I do want to run through uh, quickly uh, looking at a stock that it actually has been uh, on my radar screen for the Canson screen now uh, for the last few months. Uh, and is a stock that probably most of us are aware of, at least by name, uh, and that's PayPal. Uh, it's a pioneer in the electronic payments and, and offers a money transfer platform for person to person, person to business, and business to business. Uh, the company was spun off from eBay in 2015. Uh, if you've ever bought anything uh, or, or sold anything on eBay, chances are you're probably transacting uh, via PayPal. Uh, something like 80 or 90 percent of the transactions that take place on, on eBay are done through PayPal. Um, but it uh, was spun off from eBay in 2015 after the company had acquired uh, PayPal uh, shortly following its October 2002 IPO. So now I'm going to go through the elements of CanSlim uh, in regards to PayPal. Uh, so you're going to see here uh, a lot of the screenshots over the next several slides uh, are taken used from uh, AAII Stock Investor Pro Fundamental Stock Screening and Research Database Program. Uh, so looking at the current quarterly earnings for PayPal, uh, and this data is updated through yesterday's close, we can see here that looking at the same quarter growth in earnings over the last four quarters, um, we had a the company had a blowout quarter uh, for the period ending June 30th. Earnings were up over 86 percent um, after having a very significant drop for the period ending March 31st, which being a, a commerce oriented and payment oriented system really is not surprising given the whole COVID situation. Um, but it also had had a relatively weak uh, year over year growth in earnings the prior two quarters. 
So we've seen one blowout quarter, which is what we're looking for. Uh, hopefully for the period ending September 30th, uh, we'll see, see the same level of growth uh, from PayPal uh, to you know, really reinforce that strong earnings growth story. Looking at annual EPS uh, on the left side here, we have one, three, and five-year annualized growth rates for PayPal and earnings. Uh, over the last year, earnings were up almost 20%. Uh, but over the last three years, uh, on an average basis, earnings growth has been 21.6% a year. But over the last five years, earnings have been growing by an average of over 43%. So that's the strong growth that we're looking for uh, on an annual basis, on an annualized basis for these can slim stocks. Looking at year over year growth in earnings, we can see here that for each of the last five years, PayPal has been able to boost its earnings. Uh, so like last year, earnings were up 19%, almost 20%. Uh, and over the last five years, the growth rate has ranged from 6.7% all the way up to over 191% uh, for the year ending December of 2015. I also mentioned that O'Neill suggests looking at where earnings are going to be expected to go uh, in the next year. Uh, and analysts are projecting earnings to grow by 20% this year and by 20%, 22% next year. It's also worth noting that the stock is tracked by nearly 40 analysts, which is some of the highest coverage that I've seen uh, of any publicly traded stock. Uh, lastly, there are four analysts that are projecting annualized earnings growth of more than 23% of the year over the next over 23% a year over the next three to five years. So, and when we're looking at the new company, product service, industry trend, or management. Uh, one of the things is we're looking for a stock who's at or near a 52-week high. Well, after today's close, PayPal shares are nearly 15% below their 52-week high. So that would definitely be a ding against it uh, if you were looking to buy it as a can slim stock. But I would definitely keep it on a, uh, on a watch list since it is exhibiting the strong earnings growth we're looking for in these stocks. But currently, I'd definitely like to see that price improve and get closer to its 52-week uh, high. We can also see that over the last 52 weeks, PayPal shares have outperformed 90% of the marketplace, uh, the stock universe. Over that time, the price has gone up almost 75% and has outperformed the S&P 500 by over 54 percentage points. However, as we start working our way up and it's become more recent, we can see that there is a decline in relative strength, which is what we don't want to see. Uh, and actually over the last four weeks, uh, the price performance for PayPal is ranked only in the top 43%, which means it's actually underperformed uh, the majority of the stock universe uh, and has basically been in line with the S&P 500. So this is not the type of trend that we'd be looking for. Over the last 52 weeks, the relative strength is very high, but this weakening price performance is definitely a worry. So between that and uh, its current price relative to its 52-week high, definitely would be a, a, of slight concern. It would prevent me from buying the stock currently if I were looking to buy a, a can slim specific stock. So here looking at the S for supply and demand, uh, we have a six month price chart for PayPal. Um, and if you were, you know, if I was looking at this stock back uh, in late July and saw that after hitting a high and bouncing around a little bit, we had a strong up day that took it above PayPal, above uh, previous resistance on a above average trading volume day. This would be <coughs> what O'Neill refers to as a proper buy point. So this would be a point at which I would be buying a stock, uh, buying it if I was following the canceling methodology. Unfortunately, since then, uh, did go up from uh, roughly 180 up to over $200. So over a short period of time uh, after breaking through resistance, it did have a decent run up. But since then, we've definitely been hitting some weakness uh, to the point that actually uh, today, uh, the stock closed above that previous resistance. So if I were, if I owned the stock, I would definitely uh, be being, paying very close attention to it to decide whether or not it'd be something that it's time, time to let go. 
uh, and to prevent uh, any any to prevent any large losses. Apologies. The L element of can slim again refers to leader and laggard. Uh, and this actually is a screenshot from the investors.com website. Uh, if you're looking for basically someone to do all of your can slim analysis for you, um, investors.com, the uh, the online version of IBD does all of that for you. Uh, so I'm not here to to promote IBD, obviously. Uh, but again, if you're looking for all of this uh, in, in one place, uh, this is definitely a one stop shop in order to do all of this uh, for you. Um, but uh, so here we can see looking at different ratings uh, for um, both a composite, which is an overall rating, relative strength rating, earnings rating, and uh, it's actually sales margin on return on equity rating. Uh, PayPal ranks very highly in all of these except for relative price strength, which is not surprising uh, seeing that uh, it has, uh, it's had that weak price performance now over the last several weeks. Looking at the institutional sponsorship uh, for PayPal, again, O'Neill likes to see CanSlim stocks being owned and purchased by at least a few top rated funds, as well as other institutional owners. Well, PayPal certainly doesn't have to worry about that because it's owned by over 2,700 institutions. Uh, and these institutions own roughly 86% of all of its outstanding shares. Uh, it's also owned by 10 mutual funds rated five stars by Morning Stars, and six of those have been adding their positions over the last few months. So we definitely have institutional sponsorship, some from very uh, well-regarded uh, mutual funds, and by and large, these same mutual funds have been adding to their positions uh, over the last few months, which are definitely positives uh, in in the can slim framework. But then lastly, saving the all important to the end, we see that the current uptrend in the market uh, as represented by the NASDAQ composite has come under pr pressure over the last couple of weeks after hitting an all time high on September 2nd. Uh, after today, actually, um, we can see that the NASDAQ has seen four distribution days since hitting a new high on September 2nd. Uh, and a distribution day, again, is a decline of greater than 0.2% on a given day and seeing an increase in volume. And actually, the New York Stock Exchange composite, that is the volume that uh, that O'Neill uses when trying to identify these distribution days. So a combination of a decline of at least 0.2% in a given day. <coughs> Pardon me. It's very dry as well as a day over day increase in the total volume for the New York Stock Exchange composite. That is a distribution day. So currently we're definitely seeing the overall market trend uh, under pressure. So if you are buying new stocks right now, especially new can slim stocks specifically, you probably wouldn't want to be maybe buying smaller positions. Uh, you'd also want to be paying very close attention to the market to see whether or not any more of these distribution days start building up, which would definitely be an indicator that the overall trend is starting to reverse. But here then we can see looking at PayPal um, on a daily basis, we can see that after having that breakout and that proper buy day, we have been testing support over the last several uh, several days. But actually today, as I meant, alluded to earlier, the, mar the price actually closed below that the support that support line uh, so this definitely would be a, a negative for me, uh, as well as the fact that it's already trading below its 50-day moving average. So in the case of PayPal, you're certainly not having a, a strong trend that you would like to see from a canceling stock. Uh, this is just a different way. This is looking at the weekly chart, which is just shows trends uh, develop a little more slowly. But again, we can see that after that breakout above resistance, we now see that it's starting to test uh, that, whereas previous support, previous resistance is now becoming support. So this concludes my discussion of the O'Neill Canslim approach. Uh, in the time that I have left, I wanna to touch on another way in which we're using the Canslim strategy at AAII. Specifically, 
We're using it to manage a 10 stock portfolio within the Stock Superstars Report, of which I'm the lead analyst and editor. So if you're interested in what I've talked about this evening, AAII has a portfolio that I manage that uses the O'Neill CanSlim approach. This is actually one of four portfolios that comprise the overall Stock Superstars portfolio, with each portfolio using the buy and sell strategies of some of Wall Street's most successful stock superstars. Each of the four SSR subportfolios is made up of 10 stocks. And for the O'Neill portfolio, we isolate those companies in our 6100 stock universe using the screen that I outlined earlier. <clears throat> From this list, we filter out those stocks that present liquidity concerns to arrive at an investable universe of stocks, which is usually just a handful, especially in the current market environment. I then do additional qualitative analysis and reviews of these stocks to arrive at those that end up on the watch list, as well as the actual portfolio. We also use a, have a rules-driven strategy for when it comes time to sell the stocks in the O'Neill SSR portfolio, as well as the other three portfolio groups. While the actual O'Neill portfolio has 10 stocks, I also maintain a watch list from which I choose replacement stocks when we remove a stock using our quantitative sell rules. Having this watch list definitely makes my life easier when selecting stocks because these stocks have already been vetted, but it also offers subscribers an additional collection of investment ideas if they choose to look beyond the actual 10 stock portfolio. And here on slide 62, here's a sampling of the companies that are currently in the O'Neill watch list, which includes PayPal. So this is just a disclaimer. Um, all of our AI superstar guru screens are inspired by the respective gurus in, by their works and their philosophies. However, an example for this evening, William O'Neill was not involved in any way in the development of the SSR, uh, the AAII can slim screens. Uh, so in the passing companies might not necessarily reflect the stocks that they would invest in. So little legalese to, uh, to wrap things up. Um, but before I do, uh, lastly, as a thank you for attending tonight's webinar, we're offering a $1 one month electronic trial to AAII stock superstars report to attendees. And with this trial, you have unlimited access to the 40 stocks that make up the overall portfolio, along with weekly email alerts related to the portfolio and one issue of the monthly newsletter. You can visit the URL, the tinyurl.com slash SSR trial at the top of slide 64 to access this offer. So this concludes my remarks. Uh, I know I didn't uh, long, uh, so I do apologize. Uh, hopefully, uh, it was still informative for all of you, but I do want to thank all of you for spending your evening with me. Uh, but before I do start taking questions, I want to remind you that you can reach me via email at wayne at aaii.com with any questions, comments, or criticisms. But now, Derek, I'm ready to take some questions. Hey, excellent uh, presentation, Wayne. We got a lot of positive feedback. We uh, Hope you're ready to answer a lot of questions because the, they are definitely uh, coming in fast and furious. And uh, is that going to be, uh, is that your friend that's going to help us uh, answer some questions tonight, your co-pilot? Yes, I apologize. <laughs> we have a, a little bit of a, a stressed puppy this evening. So everyone, this is Fiona. Uh, Fiona, this is everyone. So I do apologize. She's a, she's a little freaked for some reason right now. So I apologize for this. <laughs> All right. Well, well, we'll see if we can't come up with a couple questions for Fiona as well. But uh, again, great presentation, a lot of questions. So let's uh, let's get started. Hopefully, we can get uh, to to the majority of them. But uh, so let's just get started. So Dave asked, and I know you touched on this, uh, Wayne, um, in a couple different parts. But um, Dave asked, would would you say if we are in a market downturn or an uptrend? Um, uh, I would classify it as an uptrend under pressure. Um, you know, we, we're starting to see some distribution days starting to build in the market. Um, we're also starting to see some of the market leaders, you know, the big names, Adobe, Microsoft, uh, some of these stocks that have been leading the way in the marketplace over the last several months. Some of those are also starting to see some weakness. 
So I definitely would not say that we're in a full-blown downtrend yet, but I definitely think that the current uptrend is under some significant pressure at this time. Okay, and there's definitely a, a common theme, uh, Wayne, you might, there's different versions of this questions, but uh, um, I'll, I'll ask them anyways, but let's see, George asked, uh, okay, he had a few comments first, he just said, hey, if you changed .com to cloud, it looks like uh, the NASDAQ is in a, a replay of the .com bubble, except uh, Warren Buffett, the guru of value investing, uh, is now $250 million invested uh, in this bubble with Snowflake. Yes, uh, any comments uh, you could add to, to that? Um, you know, I... I but, well, sorry, I'll just finish by saying, any, any comments on how does uh, SSR or Can Slim view the, the, the current trend or potential bubble? Uh, I mean, the trend is a trend is a trend. Uh, obviously, you know, at some point, every trend every trend comes to an end. So right now, uh, I would definitely be paying very close attention to what's going on in the market. Uh, look for these distribution days that I talked about. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, especially with, with CanSlim, there's a slide I didn't talk about it, is the fact, you know, William O'Neill could care less what the PE of a stock is. You know, a lot of these stocks have PEs of 40, 50, 60 uh, or higher. Uh, so valuation is of, is of no concern to this. What, what O'Neill is ultimately concerned about is the trend. And as long as the current trend uh, is intact, uh, then you keep buying. Uh, but then he also has a system in place to, to identify when the market is potentially starting to turn over. Uh, and with using that mechanism, then you can make defensive measures to either pare down your current holdings or to get out of the market. Now, I do wanna make the caveat that I would not use the sell strategies that I've talked about here for anything other than the can slim stocks. Um, you know, I, I tend to be more of a value-oriented investor. That's because I like that margin of safety. I'm hopefully buying undervalued stocks um, that have the potential to advance. But if there is a market downturn, uh, value stocks tend to not be hit quite as badly. Uh, so I would certainly would not try to apply, and as I said earlier, you know, market timing is not a one-size-fits-all endeavor. Same thing with the sell strategies that I've outlined here for the CanSlim. I would not try to transfer these same things uh, to you know, a value portfolio or anything like that. These are sell rules specifically catered to the very fast moving high growth stocks that, uh, that pervade the can slim strategy. Excellent, excellent. No, I think that's a, that's a good point that, uh, yeah, this is specific to can slim, so. Um, let's see, Indira asked, is there a place where we can access uh, such charts Charts with the percentages noted? So um, uh, she was a big fan of the charts that you were showing. Are there, are there sources um, for those charts? Uh, I mean, I have been actually, uh, it's, 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 I always like going to the, the stock charts website because they, they, they badgeify. Uh, and I've been a, a subscriber to stock charts for over 15 years. Uh, it's probably one of the longest services I've belonged to of, of any type. So if you're really a fan of, of charts, uh, stockcharts.com has decent free charting. But if you're really uh, really into some advanced charting, uh, the subscription to stockcharts, stockcharts.com, I think is, is totally worth it. Great, um, let's see. Uh, John just asked again, kind of sticking with the, the theme of the charts, is, is there a reason you chose the NASDAQ chart instead of the, the S&P 500? Uh, I mean, they're sort of interchangeable. Uh, actually, if I'm not mistaken, I think the S&P 500 has more distribution days currently than the, uh, the NASDAQ. Um, you know, right now it's sort of the tech market that's, run, that's driving the overall market. That's the main reason why I was looking at the NASDAQ. But you could really almost get the same, you know, interpretation of what's going on in the marketplace by looking at the S&P 500 as well. Okay. And uh, uh, you just mentioned it, uh, distribution days. But uh, and I apologize if I if I mispronounce your name. But uh, Shangro asked, uh, are there any graphs of distribution days from the first quarter of 2020? Uh, no, actually, I was. Uh, uh, before, before today, I was actually pulling up uh, historical data for the uh, the Nasdaq and uh, in, in plotting my own 
basically copying the, the price and volume data into a spreadsheet and calculating daily percentage changes to identify uh, those days where we saw a, a decline in the marketplace of more than 0.2%, uh, as well as an increase in uh, the New York NYSE composite volume uh, day over day. So I'm not aware of any. Uh, the, the IBD website does track the number of distribution days that are piling up for the NASDAQ and the S&P 500, but I'm not aware of any charting services that would plot a specific distribution day. Okay. Let's see. And again, we've we've kind of touched on these. You 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 talked about valuation, but uh, Jay asked, um, how are these rules applied in the in the current market environment where where valuations and profits don't matter? Um, you know, actually, profits do matter for the stocks that we're buying because we're looking for stocks that are generating extraordinary earnings growth, and these are real earnings. Uh, these are gap earnings. So uh, these are stocks that are actually exhibiting real earnings growth. Uh, but beyond that, uh, again, you know, if you believe in the system, you could care less you know, whether we think that the market is you know, 20, 30, 40, 50, 100, 200% overvalued. Uh, valuation does not play any role uh, in the Canslim approach. Uh, and you know, as a value investor, I do struggle with that. And uh, I, you know, I, I sometimes look at these stocks and be like, whoa, but again, this is a strategy that's specifically catered to identify high growth stocks, as well as offers rules to analyze charts, analyze the market to help you uh, time getting out when this trend starts to slow down or ultimately comes to an end. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, it's uh, as a value investor myself, I have a, I have a hard time get, wrapping my head around uh, that piece as well. But so this was a, a great presentation for for me to to think differently uh, with with uh, looking at growth stocks. So um, William asked, uh, as an A plus investor, how would I find the leading sectors uh, or subsectors in AAII's world? Is that is that something you can address, Wayne? trying to think if that data would be available at all in the markets area of the website um i'm sorry who the gentleman's name again uh it was uh william, william. yep william, william uh uh i will i'll get these lists of questions as well so i'll probably identify it nothing comes to mind offhand i'm not sure if we have this data in the the markets area of the website um, but feel free to hit me up at wayne at aaii.com to follow up to have me look into this and I will also try to make a mental note to look at this uh, and get back to you if I find your email address uh, in the list of questions. Definitely fair enough. Uh, let's see. Ah, great. So you said you've been using stock charts uh, for about 15 years, maybe longer. Michael asked a question. Uh, he, he mentions that stock charts has a ranking of companies in industry groups, uh, stock charts technical ranking and gives it a score of zero to a hundred. So okay. uh, if a stock is a can slim leader, I assume it would score high in the SCTR rating. Uh, do you know the answer to that, uh, Wayne? Uh, I've never done a, a cross analysis between the two things, but now I am intrigued. Um, so um, I'm not sure exactly what all goes into that stock charts rating, uh, but now, I, now I've got something to, to look into. Uh, so, uh, Michael, uh, again, uh, I apologize for not going offhand, but feel free to uh, do a follow-up email at wayne at ai.com, and uh, I will definitely uh, probably be look, trying to look into this uh, over the next week or so. Great, great. And uh, let's see, we have a couple couple questions uh, around the same theme. Uh, Don asks, do big institutions have to report buying and selling daily? Uh, I am, if I am not mistaken, no, they don't. They have to file um, uh, SEC filings, I think either every three months or every six months. I am not aware anywhere. And if anyone uh, is, if I'm misspeaking, I'm sure someone will probably jump into the, the comments or questions area to, to point that out. But I don't believe, I think it's either every three months or every six months. Yeah, that's that's my understanding as well, every, every three months, so. Um... But we can we can certainly look into that. Um, let's see. 
Uh, okay, here's kind of a similar question. Chun asked, how can you identify whether institutional investors are supporting a stock or selling it on the dips if they hide their intention by buying or selling in small volumes to attract retail investors to buy before they finally offload their shares? I mean, even if they're buying, at the end of the day, the volume is still showing up in the in the daily volume. Um, so, I mean, they can they can try to spread it out, but uh, it's still the, the volume is there. And the and institutional investors are controlling about 80 to 90 percent of the trading volume. So they can try to spread it out, but the volume is still showing up. Uh, and at the end of the day, it's still it's still I've, they're, they're going to be hard pressed if they have any significant volume to, to offload or if they're looking to invest, it's gonna be very difficult for them to be able to mass that uh, for, for any period of time without that showing up in the in the overall trend of the stock changing. And I uh, just saw a response come from Ann saying that uh, to the previous question, uh, they have to file quarterly 13G or a 13F filing with the SEC. I thought it was a 13F, so we have to thank you very much for the, the follow-up. Yeah, thank, thank you, Ann, for the follow-up. Uh, let's see. Uh, Dilbert asked, he said, whoa, not so fast. I think he was channeling his uh, Lee Corso, but he said on the, <laughs> the XPEL chart, uh, there was a down day on huge volume prior to the breakout. What about that? How do you, how do you assess that? Let's see here. Oh, I think that was the one. If you yep. go forward. Yep. Uh, that was the part creation of the handle. So, uh, you know, yeah, you did have that one initial spike. Actually, it's not surprising because it was butting up against uh, resistance right there. But generally speaking, the trend uh, in the, the handle, you take away that one big volume day, up day, uh, was a general decline in volume over that handle period. All right. Uh, let's see. Dorothy had a, a good question. I was I was wondering the same thing. How, how do I know where to set the support and resistance uh, parameters? Uh, that, you know, that that is definitely a little more uh, art than science um but uh if i can situate my friend here uh let's uh let's do this so this is actually looking at stock charts uh i've got three different uh time periods set up for the the nasdaq i've got uh, 30 minutes intraday charts, I have a daily charts, and I have weekly charts. When I'm looking at the market or individual uh, stocks, uh, I look at basically where things start bouncing off or, or running into. So for the example, looking at an intraday chart, uh, we saw that today, uh, over the last uh, few days, the NASDAQ has been basically hitting resistance around the uh, 11,250 mark. Um, what's going on then at, we can see that, you know, at basically that same level at the daily chart, that was the, the last high, uh, for the NASDAQ. Uh, so that until, until that, uh, mark is, is breached on the upside, uh, that definitely would be a, a resistance point, uh, going forward, uh, for the NASDAQ. And then looking at a supporting element. Uh, the same thing is, you know, we can see that the NASDAQ, you know, peaked. Uh, actually, there was a a large amount of volume that was not able to to propel it above it. Uh, so, you know, this weekly, this large red weekly bar uh, is uh, is an indicator uh, of, you know, and this is something that I've learned uh, through chart analysis over the years, uh, is that is an indicator of another key element of the the volume wasn't there, the buy volume wasn't there to move the, the NASDAQ above that previous uh, high. So, I mean, a lot of this comes from its practice. 
you know, I've been, I've been doing this for 20 plus years. Uh, I'm still, I still struggle sometimes. Um, but, you know, looking at multiple uh, periodicities, so intraday, daily, and weekly, uh, you can get a good idea of, you know, resistance is, is going to probably crop up, you know, doesn't matter what your periodicity is. So it's, it's ultimately, it's, it's practice, practice, practice. Um, and, you, and you get a feel for it uh, over time. Let's see. I was waiting for a, a question for Fiona, but I uh, haven't seen one come across yet. Like, uh, what's your favorite uh, dog biscuit? But uh, maybe we'll we'll wait for that one. Uh, she she likes see. she likes Caesar's soft treats. That's her favorite. <laughs> okay, there we go. There we go. Um, uh, th this was a question I I actually had. Um, you know, you mentioned that can slim. It, it's 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 your favorite approach of the the four approaches that you you follow as a part of SSR. Um, let, 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 let me let me put a caveat to that. It's it's from a from a management standpoint, I find it most interesting. Uh, I I would have to say probably my most favorite approach of the four is probably the John Neff approach, just because I think it's so straightforward. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, from a, from a management standpoint. Uh, uh, slim sort of keeps me on the keeps me on my toes so that that's why i like it uh, from a management standpoint okay and that's what i was going to get to uh, from a management uh standpoint what what do you actually look at on a on a daily basis because it, it is a very active strategy uh you know actually and i i screwed up i should have i should have looked into this uh, i actually uh, <laughs> i actually uh, about uh three weeks ago started doing a, a daily trading journal where i have put in uh basically where i bought the stock um you know the seven percent eight percent down from high which I fully admit i don't follow to the letter in the ssr uh portfolio uh i've in you know it, it could be heresy if you're a true can slimmer i apologize um i just i've str still struggled with that um, and we've have still had uh, good results letting that ride a little bit more. Um, but I'm looking at then, you know, decline from high. Uh, then I start looking at the at different charts and I come up with defensive stop levels and, you know, beyond, you know, if it's hitting, uh, looking to try to find uh, support and resistance levels, looking at moving average levels and things like that. Um, and that's, you know, I, I then on a daily basis every day, track you know what my gain has been since the purchase for the portfolio uh and where it is relative to my defensive stops and that's something that i do spend about an hour every day uh tracking all of that and it's you know it's really helped me uh and it's improved my discipline and it's really helped me become i think a better manager of the the, the, the o'neill portfolio within ssr See everyone, you're in very good hands with uh, Wayne managing this uh, portfolio. He's he's on top of it. So, um, and I'm just gonna apologize. Uh, we have so many questions that have uh, rolled in. Um, do, do you have time for maybe three more? And then we. Uh, uh, I, I've 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 got the time. Uh, if and if people are willing to to stay on, I'll definitely answer them. All right. Well, let's get to a, a few more then. Uh, Mahendra asks, uh, Wayne, from the liquidity perspective, do you also consider minimum volume in choosing the momentum growth stocks? Uh, what do you consider minimum average volume? Um, you know, for the, for the stocks that are passing the CanSlim strategy, especially with the level of institutional investment that normally is 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 going on. Oh, Fiona says goodbye. Um, uh, the the level of of institutional investment in the most of the stocks that uh, exhibit all of these different can slim strategies, volume and liquidity is is not a, an issue at all. Uh, actually, in the, the second edition of his book, uh, O'Neill actually was uh, would prefer, had preferred you invest in stocks that have a limited amount of float. Um, but uh, adding that level of criteria, you know, PayPal certainly wouldn't be in there. Uh, most of the, actually all of the stocks that are held in the SSR um, O'Neill portfolio would not be in there if we did look for a, a maximum float. Um, so from a from a momentum standpoint, uh, the, the, the growth criteria uh, that uh, 
have to be exhibited for these CanSlim screens uh, are just too sexy for, for institutional investors to ignore. So the liquidity is, is more than enough for all of these. So it's nothing that I would have to ever worry about uh, for any of these stocks that are in the uh, SSR O'Neill portfolio. Okay. And I think, George, uh, you had a question about uh, float, no float as well. So uh, I think that addressed your question. Um, uh, we have a question from Shirley asking, what what is different between 10-week moving average and the 50-day moving average? Uh, from a from a daily weekly standpoint, absolutely nothing. Uh, just if I'm looking at something on a weekly or a versus a daily basis, I want to make sure that my moving averages uh, are covering the same, basically same per, uh, number of, of trading periods. Uh, so that's why I make that adjustment on the daily or weekly level. Excellent. Uh, let's see. Um, Jennifer asked, what time frame do you use on charts? It looks like you you kind of look at a few different ones. Uh, I mean, for, for the purposes of this, I was limiting things uh, to, uh, to six months. Um, but I normally will look at uh, a one to two year period, uh, try to give me a, a, an idea of a, of a quote unquote full cycle, uh, or at least give me a, you know, a couple of years for the individual stock. Uh, so that's sort of my preferred uh, time period. Gets beyond that, things get too compressed and uh, you sort of start losing uh, perspective. So uh, one to two years is normally my sweet spot when I'm looking at uh, looking at stocks. Okay. Um, Wayne, there's a, a few questions, people asking about the, the Can Slim portfolio and, and performance. Uh, uh, people are wondering how, how that's performed in, in 2020. And if you can just talk about performance. Uh, I was, I was anticipating now. that question there. <laughs> Excellent. Um, through, the, uh, through the end of August, uh, the SSR uh, portfolio was up. Uh, almost 19% year to date, whereas the IYY, which is the bogey uh, or benchmark uh, for the SSR portfolio was up just under 10%. Um, over the last year, it's up 36.6% versus 21.8% for the uh, IYY. Uh, over the last three years, it's been averaging almost 21% uh, a year gain versus a little over 14% a year for the IYY. Over the last 10 years, it's been averaging almost a uh, little over 19% a year versus almost 15% uh, for the IYY. And since inception, which was uh, January of 20, 2002, uh, the CanSlim strategy has been returning uh, almost 11.3% a year versus 8.4% for the IYY. Excellent. Excellent. You know we always get those uh, types of questions, so uh, <laughs> glad to see you were prepared with a thorough answer. Love it. Um, uh, and just a general comment for for everyone: there, there's been a few people that have been asking you to to repeat some of the names of the books, and I just oh. want everyone to know that uh, there Wayne will can do that. But um, just tomorrow there will be uh, what we call show notes that will be emailed out to everyone. So anytime there's a, a reference to a, a book or a website, it will be included in the show notes. But you can go ahead and answer that if you want now, Wayne. Yes, for instant gratification, we have how to make stocks, how to make money in stocks. Uh, again, this is the second edition, which is the uh, the what I outlined today. Uh, the book is currently in its fourth uh, edition. Uh, William O'Neill, How to Make Money in Stocks. Uh, it's out of print actually, but I was able to pick it up on Amazon, I think for like 20 bucks. So uh, what I discovered is, is um, especially when the market conditions started to change, uh, the original CanSlim criteria started generating fewer and fewer passing stocks. And if you're trying to make money selling a stock picking strategy, having a stock picking strategy that doesn't have any stocks to pick can become <laughs> a little bit of a problem. So as we've moved on and now in the fourth edition, the criteria have been relaxed somewhat uh, ultimately, I believe, and, and you know, it could be the the the, the skeptic and, and my jaded individual personality, but I think that that's why some of the the criteria have changed is ultimately to have more uh, companies pass 
uh, but then also as a supplement. And this is actually geared towards the fourth edition. So you might see a little bit of sometimes some conflicting information, but I still think it's a great book. Uh, Matthew Galgani's How to Make Money in Stocks, uh, Getting Started. Excellent. Love that instant and, uh, gratification. Matt, I, and Matt, if I'm mispronouncing your last name, I apologize. <laughs> um, let's see. Well, you did mention Amazon and William asked, uh, maybe maybe tongue in cheek, but he says, what, what's going to be the next Amazon? I'm going to listen intently here as well. Uh, you know, could it be Tesla? You know, is, you know, who knows? You know, it's Amazon. I mean, I don't see how, you know, Amazon obviously is not going to be able to continue the the exponential growth that it's been reporting. Although, you know, depending on how long uh, COVID sets in, you know, I I know, I know I, I have almost on a daily basis boxes flowing into my house uh, with the little smiley face on them. Um, so, you know, who knows? And that's the, you know, what is the, you know, what where do you think the trends are going to be going forward? You know, PayPal's been around you know, for, for 20 years. Um, but, you know, they're able to be latching on to what's going to be, I think, a, a long-term trend, you know, contactless payment, electronic payments. Um, you know, they had the, their strongest quarter ever this past quarter. Uh, and, you know, it's they're, they're teaming up with, you know, CVS, a lot of other uh, retailers where you can have your PayPal app. And instead of having a credit card, you can pay at a, at a point of service uh, and retailers using PayPal. So, you know, the opportunities for PayPal to, to take advantage of, you know, contactless, the, the desire for contactless, uh, you know, cashless society, which, you know, has definitely gotten a lot more of attention, uh, you know, recently because of, you know, people not wanting to, to transfer cash. The fact that, you know, there's there's a coin shortage. Uh, I keep telling my mom she needs to cash in all her quarters from her uh, casino winnings. Um, but, uh, you know, who, but yeah, who knows? It's, you know, where are things going to be going forward? Uh, you know, it's, it's, you know, office, it's consumer trends. So, you know, what could be happening, uh, in the consumer marketplace that we could be shifting? You know, uh, I think PayPal is, is positioned to be, uh, uh, anticipating at least a shift in consumer behaviors with, uh, with more interest in electronic payments or something like that. But if you're able to, uh, to identify, what you think that next uh, market trend is going to be? Uh, I'd keep it to yourself and just slowly start buying up those stocks. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hey, I think uh, this will be the the last one for tonight, Wayne. Um, and I think it's a it's a good one, and there's been a couple uh, with this theme in it. Uh, let's see. Wayne asks, uh, he says, hey, I'm new to all this. Can you review and just at a high level? Can you re review and contrast? value investing like how would you compare value investing to to can slim is it uh, is one long term versus short term uh buy and sell aspects um uh, and if it sure. doesn't apply he says don't don't worry no it's a, that's a it's an excellent question uh and you know love the name by the way um and uh you know it's it's a it's a question a lot of people ask uh you know generally speaking you know value tends to be a, a longer term approach uh, with value, you're looking for stocks that have, of fundamentally sound companies that, for whatever reason, the market has knocked down at share price. Uh, might have had a bad quarter. There might have been a bad, piece of bad news, something like that. But something has happened where you know, on fundamentally, the company still looks strong. Just something has happened to knock down its price. So you're trying to buy these uh, you know, good companies uh, at a good price. Uh, hoping that at some point the market realizes, oh, you know, things weren't as bad as we thought uh, and the market's, uh, you know, institutional money uh, starts flowing back into these stocks. But you've already bought at a, at a discount price and then you get to enjoy the write up that in a, at its core uh, is value investing with, uh, you know, specifically can slim all work. I mean, we're looking for, you know, tremendous quarterly and annual earnings growth. And because of that strong growth, um, that's attracting a lot of institutional money, which is bidding up the stock price, which is leads to oftentimes uh, astronomically high uh, P.E. ratios and various price multiples. Um, because of these high multiples and the fact that, you know, a, a, a bad quarter for one of these stocks 
could be ruined <coughs> uh, in, in the short term. Uh, this is a strategy that you have to monitor very closely. Um, you know, I would say any more than an, a week, a weekly checkup of your uh, can slim stocks and you're, you're flirting, you're flirting with a disaster, uh, in my opinion. Uh, that's why I look at these things on a daily basis. But these are stocks that are just, you know, they're high flying. You know, uh, we, um, I mean, stocks in, our, in the SSR portfolio, you know, we're up a couple of ones we bought recently, we're up 70, 80% uh, in just three or four months. <coughs> so these move very quickly. Um, and you want to be paying very close attention to what's going on in the marketplace to try to identify when that turnover in the overall trend might taking place so you can get out. Uh, this is definitely not a set it and forget it uh, type strategy. So hopefully that at least provides a, a sort of a 30,000 foot view of the, of the difference between value investing uh, and, and canceling. No, definitely. Thanks, Wayne. That was a great presentation. Very informative. Uh, and I'll just pass it to, to Ryan to kind of walk it, walk us out. Thanks, Wayne. Good night, everybody. Take care. All right, folks. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, I wanted to uh, thank everybody. We did go a little bit long, but uh, that's okay. It was very informative. Um, coming up next week, we have uh, which is the best one, two, three, and four fund strategy. That is a webinar that's being put on by uh, Paul Merriman, who is a frequent contributor to AAI. Uh, he's the uh, president of the Merriman Financial uh, Education Foundation, and uh, so that will be next week at 7.30 Central. Uh, and the following week, on September 30th, uh, we will have a, a presentation from Charles Rotblut, who's the uh, AAII Journal Editor. Uh, it's called uh, Update on the AI Way Project, and um, just as kind of a, a quick teaser for that uh, webinar, that one will be highly interactive. We will have uh, some uh, questions and uh, polls uh, for that webinar. Won't want to miss it. Uh, help uh, guide uh our, our project on that and uh helping to build your uh own financial uh investing plan um so with that i wanted to uh, wish everybody uh good health and good wealth good night